All this is Dr. Mubin Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. My apologies, I'm a little late. Today we are going to talk about a landmark study, a first ever study of vaccine injuries, uh, neurological injuries, and the study by NIH or National or a sub department, National Institute of Neurological Disorders. This is the first study of vaccine injury, the preprint coming out of the official healthcare systems. That's one. Second, it's a small study, 23 patients. It seems like there may be some data revisions that are still needed because we have one of the participants with us here. So Brie Dressen is with us. Brie, welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for coming in uh, for a, on a short notice. So Brie has been participating in this study. She is unfortunately vaccine injured and she is still even today, Brie, uh, if I don't, if you don't mind, can I see your arm? <laughs> yes. So even today you had the IVIG? Yes. Yes. Right. So uh, clearly there are patients who have not recovered. Contrary to the impression that the the document itself presents. And again, it is a preprint, so maybe that document still needs revisions and corrections and updates. Um, what I'm going to do is this. Number one, we're going to look at the study. And number two, we're going to talk with Brie to see what her experience has been, not only for her own symptoms, but with NIH as well. So Brie, once again, welcome. Tell us a little bit about you, your current state, and the study that you participated in. So I was a previously healthy mother of two. I was a preschool teacher. I was healthy. I hiked and climbed. Um, I was in prime physical condition. And so I enlisted in the fight against COVID by enrolling in a clinical trial for a COVID vaccine, AstraZeneca, here in the United States. Um, within an hour of my shot, I got tingling down my arm. And that later that night, I had vision problems. So vision became blurred and double. And it sounded like I had seashells over both of my ears. And that night I had a typical vaccine response. I woke up in the next morning, the, you know, the fever and, and malaise, all that had resolved, but the sensory issues were still there and they were getting worse. And I got up to get ready for work. My left leg was slumped and I was walking into the left doorway. It's always to the left. And that day I went to work and the little kids' voices were really loud. So, you know, uh, by the end of the class period, the sound was so uh, extreme in my, you know, sensory was just off the charts. And so I parked the kids in front of the TV and they had a learning channel going and I was holed up in the corner just waiting for their parents to come get them. That was the last day that I taught. And after that, you know, my symptoms cascaded from there over the next two and a half weeks. I ended up with severe tachycardia, uh, temperature fluctuations. I ended up with the strange tremors, the adrenaline dumps, uh, the impending doom. It's a, it's a very bizarre thing, you know, um, and I lost control of my legs. I lost control of my bladder. I had to retrain my legs. I landed in the hospital two and a half weeks in, and I had this horrific internal vibration sensation. And that, that still is the one thing that it's kind of like a, a, it plagues me. That's my least favorite thing, the tinnitus. So it, it just kind of fired off a whole cascade of issues. And I still, to this day, I am better, but I, you know, I'm still totally dependent on my physicians and my medical teams to help me. I have a very restricted diet and I have to go get IVIG. It's $3,500 every two weeks. And that's just to stave things off so I can function. And so I can try to have somewhat of a normal life. I'm still not working. Um, my body is still, you know, like glass. And so, but I am hopeful that things will improve, you know. We too, and praying for you for complete recovery. Um, can I have a little levity and say that at least from the studies point of view, you have recovered? <laughs> right. This is right? what so cure I, looks like. So, hmm. yeah. So, so this is what I wanted to uh, see. Is, so, quick references. This is drbean.com. Here is a study that we are going to look at. Um, this is their PDF. 
then there are certain links here which talk about the study and its uh, further um, implications. We have Dr. Nath. I believe Dr. Nath, and Brie, please correct me, Dr. Nath was the one who is uh, a corresponding author for the study and helping with uh, running the study. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, he was the principal investigator on the study. Got it. So you were in contact with him and his team. Yes, he was yeah. the first one we made contact with in January of 2021. So that's Got what it. started the study. Got it. And before going into the details of the study, the audience here, the cool beans here, uh, look, they're saying that we have 23 patients. So they had 23 patients, 92% females, median age 40 years. And the important thing that was uh, worth looking at is the following. R right off the bat, I wanted to make sure that we see this. If you see here, they have uh, grouped the these 23 patients in no treatment group or corticosteroid group, long taper, corticosteroid short taper, and IVIG. I believe Brie is part of the IVIG. Plus you had steroids as well, correct? Correct. And here, what they're saying is that IVIG number was three, full recovery after 12 weeks, that is about three months. They are saying all three have recovered. Now, Brie, at least from this data that they are presenting to the world, they're saying that you have recovered. Right. But you have so not recovered. Like, no, nope. So tell me this, this 12 weeks, when was this? So when did they start? How, how did this come together that you had the vaccine? Unfortunately, you got injured. How did you contact NIH or how did they contact? What happened? Can you tell me? I want to understand they are declaring you recovered. When was that? How did this whole thing transpired? So my husband's a, a PhD chemist. So right as soon as I got sick, he started combing through research, trying to figure out what was wrong with me, because obviously my doctors had no clue. And the drug company was not talking. Um, they actually, the first time I ever heard directly from the drug company was three weeks ago. So that's a long time to figure this out on our own. So he reached out to scientists all over the world. We reached out to Germany. I sent my blood to Germany December, so a month after my injury. And we, you know, we, we started getting the ball rolling on figuring out what was going on. At this time, we thought I was the only person that had this type of reaction. So I thought it was an isolated incident. So we reached out to the NIH essentially to report this injury because we were kind of questioning what AstraZeneca was doing with my data. And Dr. Nath responded within 24 hours. They took it very seriously. We had a telehealth within a couple of days. And before we knew it, we were sending, you know, samples across the country and they were considering trying to figure out when I could come out for further evaluation. And unfortunately, we all know what happened after that, you know, it, it, it turned into a cascade of patients, tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands, you know. And so they got bombarded by people after me. And so it just, they had more than enough of a study group that they could pull from. So they picked who they wanted to bring out. And I was one of the very, I feel I was very lucky to have been chosen to uh, participate in this study and be able to go out in person for further evaluation and treatment. And that happened in mid-June. So I went in mid-June, mm. they did a full workup. I was there for eight days and uh, it ended with five days of IVIG. And then we did follow up for several weeks over um, telehealth. And we tracked our data every week. We sent them a new uh, update on our condition, what was working, what wasn't. And we were supposed to go back out in September. And our follow-up appointments got canceled. And by did, December, did, it was radio silence. This simply canceled it? Did. So, yes. So th it is just baffling for me. So maybe they internally said, fine, they, these guys have recovered, guys and gals have recovered, we're done, and no more need to follow up. Did they tell you well, that we're stopping the follow-up, we're done? But they just radio no. silence. 
yeah, it was just radio silence. And then we learned through the, the grapevine. I got an email from Nath in December. He said, we're not studying this. Stop sending people this way. Um, so, but that, they knew they knew the exact state of everyone's condition because we had to precisely track what was happening in our bodies with this preset set of um, you know conditions. And I, I believe they drew that from the lung hauler scale that they use uh, through the World Health Organization set up this symptom scale for lung haulers, and that's what they used to track our progress. So they knew that we were not 100% recovered. They knew people were struggling. Um, they knew that we were not back to work. So. This is so sad. So let me tell you a few of my uh, events in in a, today and yesterday. The study came out, this study, it became such a big buzz that hey, NIH and the uh, National Institute of uh, Neuro Neurological Disorders, NINDA, this is their first study and they are talking about the vaccine injury for the first time ever. Somebody from the government organization is actually presenting a study and they are saying everybody recovered and we gave them cortic uh, corticosteroids, some with the long taper, some with the short and with IVIG. So that's it. And here I'm sitting with a, with a participant who is saying that number one, you you got your treatment even today. Number two, you're saying that even others have not felt better. And number three, I can tell you if somebody is vaccine injured, just corticosteroids is not going to have them recover because corticosteroid is a temporary suppression of the immune system. It does nothing else. So I agree. As much as I was excited. And that's what, we've seen, and that's what I've experienced as well. So yeah, I was so I was excited that for the first time, one, there is a recognition, and number two, there is a solution that they're saying, hey, 12 weeks later, we are good. And here we are seeing that there is not the best um, update. It bothers me. So tell me this. I'm going to open this table once more. They said that corticosteroid long taper, corticosteroid short taper. Did you get a corticosteroid dose as well? I did, and I didn't get a taper, and it was the biggest mistake of anything that I've tried so far. So I did 1,000 milligrams of IV solumedrol for five days. And I felt pretty good when I was on it. Um, I was I was surprised at how good I felt. Mm. Like, that's a lot of medicine for my body. <laughs> mm. But I mm. made it, mm. you know, but I crashed really hard after. And my neuropathy actually got worse um, when I came mm. off just suddenly. Mm. So... Yeah, I, the steroids are concerning to me personally, but. So you were, so was your course three days, a short course, was it a week? Mine was five days. Five so days. Five days in a row, IV solumedrol. Very interesting. So it's very confusing looking at the data and that data is in opposition to what I'm hearing from you as well. Is it right. possible, again, we don't have the rest of the patients. I think I'm going to request you, if possible, to figure out where are the rest of the patients and talk with them as well. Do you think that they are feeling better? Is it that you are an exception and you're not feeling better, but others have? What is your... So, uh, I know at least half of the participants in this study and none of them are better. Okay, so that, that bothers me. So I want to go to this page number nine that you asked me to look at. So um, I'm so sorry for the audience that instead of looking at the study itself, I wanted to see various parts of it. I wanted to highlight that as much as it is fun to look at this study from the point of view of there is a study, landmark study from the government resources, and uh, it looks like data is not correct. So I want to just see one more area here. So this is page nine. Here they are saying, Treatment with corticosteroids or IVIG had been clinically administered by patients treating neurologists or an NIH neurologist consultant. 12 patients, 50%, received oral corticosteroids. Seven of nine, 75%, patients who received standard prednisone dosing 
0.75 to 1 milligram per kilogram for seven days, followed by weak weekly taper of 20% of the initial dose, reported significant symptoms, symptom improvement after two weeks. Then they say three patients who had persistent symptoms of small fiber neuropathy and dysautonomia for five to nine months were treated with one cycle of IVIG. I believe Brie is part of this group they're talking about, three patients. And they're talking about five to nine months later, the patient still had the symptoms and they had small fiber neuropathy. So they gave these patients two gram per kilogram divided over five days. Two had been previously treated with corticosteroids with no improvement. So maybe Brie, you were one of these two. Right. And then they say in all three symptoms improved dramatically within two weeks of IVIG treatment with complete resolution in one and mild residual symptoms in the other two. So did this happen? Did your symptoms actually dramatically improve? And so then... this is what I'm trying to figure out because if you actually only looked at a snapshot of two weeks post IVIG, um, I felt quite a bit better at two weeks post IVIG. When the IVIG wore off, I went back to being as sick as ever. So that's very interesting. Yeah. So if I was a researcher, I observed you for two weeks after IVIG and I said, all good, 100%. I'm going to write it down 100%. I should know as a medical doctor that IVIG is only going to clean out what is in the in the body running around the other antibodies or antigens, but IVIG is going to wear, wear off. Normally, human antibodies wear off between three to six weeks. So usually by three weeks, you may start having the symptoms again. But they have already noted it down within two weeks, so from their point of view, it seems like it is okay. Um, then, then they, they say, followed us for beyond two weeks. So we know hmm. that they have the data for several weeks beyond two weeks. Well, that's interesting. So they actually followed you further and they only yeah. reported on the two weeks when you felt better. Right. And of the 11, that's, of the 11 patients that never received immunotherapy, seven, had partial recovery, three have had no improvement, and one had complete recovery by 12 weeks post onset as determined by subjective assessment and return to pre-morbid functional status. The only question left in my head is, what is the final status today? Out of 23, 10 fully recovered or 15 or... Looking at the therapy, corticosteroids and IVIG, I would suspect nobody has recovered. It would appear that way. I don't know anybody that went that's recovered. Okay, so um, let's do this. Let's go over the study together, just so that we have looked at the study as well. So 23 patients, 92% female. 100% reported sensory symptoms. So th these are neurological symptoms comprising severe face and or limb paresthesias. Paresthesias are abnormal sensations. And 61% had orthostasis. So when they are standing up, they have the blood pressure abnormalities, heat intolerance, and palpitations, tachycardia. Autonomic testing in 12 identified seven with reduced distal sweat production and six positional orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So distal sweat production is as the body's distance from the center, let's say the center is the brain, as the body's distance continues to increase, the, the farther distant parts of the body are not producing the sweat as correctly. And what is the reason for that? Of course, there is an order from the autonomic nervous system to say produce the sweat. So in the early parts, it is producing sweat and in the later not, that means the neurological system, the nerves are damaged or are under stress or are inflamed. And so the, the signals are not traveling far enough. And so early part of the body are showing sweat and the later part are not. And then they're saying that, um, where was that? 
positional orthostatic tachycardia syndrome was present as well. And that is when you stand up or where, whenever there is a gravitational pull on the blood, when you change your position, tachycardia is occurring. Then they say among 16 with lower leg skin biopsies, lower leg skin biopsies, 31% had diagnostic subthreshold epidermal neurite densities. So they had problems with the, um, with the nerves. 13% were borderline and 19% showed abnormal axonal swelling. So ex exons, and my apologies, I was doing a discussion with Bree beforehand. Uh, we know that a nerve has a cell body or soma. That cell body has a number of fibers bringing signals to it. These are called dendrites. Dendrites. And then there is this cell body. And then there is an outflow. There is a long fiber that goes to some part of the body distant. This long fiber is the exon. And exon has the myelin sheath on it. And they are talking about this exon. And they are saying this exon is damaged. Or what are they saying exactly? They are saying 19% showed abnormal exon swelling. So it was inflamed. It was swollen. That means it was under attack by immune system. Why would it swell up? There may be antibodies that are settling here. Or there may be immune complexes, antibody and antigen complexes, which antigen may be produced by the vaccine itself. So those complexes, when they settle on any tissue, our immune system would attack that tissue and cause swelling and even destruction of it. Biopsies from randomly selected five patients that were evaluated for immune complexes showed deposition of complement C4D in endothelial cells. So what happens is that, um, so let's say vaccine is given and that has caused the inflammation, right? So local reaction and immune system become active. We did this discussion yesterday, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, these things go and they work on the liver and the liver in turn will produce complement proteins. Complement proteins are then going to enter blood vascular system and they will try to go to the area where the inflammation is. At the same time, when the complement systems are activated, there are, so if this is a complement protein, usually it gets broken down into two pieces we normally call them, let's say if it is protein number three, complement C3 stands for complement protein number three. It might break down into C3, it will, A and C3B. A for the action part and B for the binding part. Similarly, if you read here, they're talking about C4, where was it? C4D, so A, B, C, D. So C4 proteins, C4D part was found in the blood vessels. Now, when it was found there, complexes showed deposition of C4D in endothelial cells. So that means what they said was, this C4D part was on the blood vessel cells deposited, like dust here. That will make the endothelial cells a target for the immune system and local inflammation would occur and blood vessels will be swollen, inflamed, blocked and even the clotting will be triggered because there are local toxic substances that can trigger clotting. Then they say electrodiagnostic test results were normal in 94%. Together, 52% of patients had objective evidence of small fiber peripheral neuropathy. I haven't discussed that yet, but because we're talking about inflammation in a couple of days, we, will, we are kind of ready to understand what this is, so we'll talk about it. 
58% of patients treated with oral corticosteroids had complete or near complete improvement after 2 weeks as compared to 9% of patients who did not receive immunotherapy having full recovery at 12 weeks so the steroids we have done this discussion many times are going to suppress the immune system now is it possible that you suppress the immune system and the immune system just falls in place meaning all the abnormal cells go away the problem is that if we have a immune system dysregulation then it is not necessary that steroids would just correct the dysregulation they might suppress it patient might feel better because there is not much inflammation but as soon as the steroids effect is removed then the inflammation would resume at 5 to 9 months post symptom onset three non recovering patients breeze one of them received intravenous immunoglobulin with symptoms resolution within 2 weeks and may i add this intense symptoms reappearance after that right so then they said conclusion this observational study suggests that a variety of neuropathic symptoms may manifest after SARS-CoV-2 vaccinations and in some patients might be an immune mediated process that's not a, a rocket science conclusion but still that is the conclusion they have i was hoping considering the data the patients they would have given us some more um did they probably also say that more studies are required Yeah, uh, I think on page five they they said that the further studies are needed and they encouraged, you know, yeah, more right. investigation. Okay, so let's see. I'm pretty sure it's page five. Page five here. Yes, at the top. Yeah. So we are further on investigation page... is required. Um, here. further investigation is required to explore underlying mechanisms and targeted therapies for those neurological disorders okay <clears throat> so of course i hope that this sentence helps us understand that they do not believe that corticosteroids or ivig would just solve it here we report clinical ev- evaluation of patients with new onset paresthesias with or without autonomic symptoms incidents incident to SARS-CoV-2 vaccination and response to immunotherapy with corticosteroids or intravenous ivig got it so um what have you learned so this started happening in before june of last year right yes so by the time i physic was physically at the nih i had been suffering with this for 7 months so mm-hmm. i was obviously you know um my theory is there's an acute phase you know and then there's the chronic phase and hopefully we can all get to the healing phase and so at that point you know i was firmly in what i felt was the chronic phase the acute phase was over within 2 3 weeks so mm. it 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 does make me wonder and in previous conversations i had had with dr na bri your network connection may have become stressed sorry so we lost you for a few seconds bri yeah i know this so he, uh, dr nath did talk about early intervention being key in yeah. this and that was last july that we had those discussions uh but of mm. course as we all know uh, none of that information made it to the public um mm. until now and and in this manuscript i was i was looking for something about the early intervention um suggestion and of course that didn't make it into the manuscript so i'm not sure but i am encouraged i mean these are these are the minds you know the leading minds in this in this country in neurology mm. that are discussing mm. this they didn't rule out that neurological issues could come from the vaccines they didn't you know but i i am concerned that it was minimized um mm. but at the same time you know i think mm. that they were they were pretty honest with the symptoms that they evaluated the autonomic dysfunction is something that we see constant you know 
uh, Sean Barkovage, I know that you know him. He's with us at react19.org. And we're, we're tracking this with these patients uh, because mm. this data was not being disclosed to the public. So we realized we needed to start, you know, evaluating this on our own. So, so I am this is happy actually, to see this. Hmm. This is actually an important point. Uh, they were studying this since last year's beginning somewhere. January. January. And they are publishing it now or at least it's sending it to preprint now. Why such a long delay? This is this version posted May 17, 2022. We are May, May 20th. So 12 plus 5, 17 months later? Do you, uh, did, did they discuss? I, I do not know if they discussed with the participants what their plan is to, to publish it or not to publish it. Did, did you yes. have any expectation from them? Yes, multiple people had been reassured that they would publish last summer at the latest. Uh, those promises began as early as last March, so March of 2021. And I'm mm. unsure what the hangup was. Um, they weren't specific with that. Um, but we were, we grew more and more concerned, especially after our follow-up visits were canceled. And mm. so then at that point, we were like, what, what's going on with our data? We have people's lives depending on this information coming out from reputable sources. You know, we, we were all, we had our eggs in this basket waiting for this to, you know. And it was just not us. you. Yeah. And it was just not you. It was possibly many other. Yes. So th that's, that's. Disturbing, I'm using the, the word disturbing a lot today. That is disturbing that one, they knew that this was happening from January of last year, beginning of the vaccination almost, right? December is when the vaccinations started. Um, then they were working with the patients. They were seeing neurological issues. They were seeing that these were refractory. They were not fixing. And they had the data. They did not give any heads up. Did they... Now, did they do it because they thought it's just too rare? We only have these 23 patients and that's about it. Or were they, the data was not there or were they lazy? Was it deliberate? Do you have any um, conjectures? Those are all really good questions. I know that once we realized that they were one of the only research institutions in the world that we knew of that was looking into this, we flooded them with patients. Uh, I myself referred hundreds to them. So they had their pick of the litter. They, they chose who they wanted. And there were several more that they worked with remotely with their home physicians. And, you know, some people were enrolled in this study, but the vast majority of who they worked with and discussed with, they were not. And it appears, you know, the responses that people got, responses that physicians got, from them because we sent a lot of people. We said, hey, have your doctor call uh, this research team at the NIH. They know what's going on and they can help you know, guide your physician in your care or at least say, yes, neurological issues are happening. We're not entirely sure why, but you need to take care of your patient. And they did do that mm -hmm. for a long time, um, mm -hmm. but something shifted and those conversations became more and more cryptic as, um, the end of 2021 progressed, and then it was radio silence by the end of the year. Very interesting. So 17 months later, they at least send out a preprint, which has lots of inaccuracies, at least in my opinion, from speaking with you. Um, I was actually very excited about it, that they are recognizing and our people would have a way to go in. Anyways, I'm repeating myself. Um, so as a patient then, you have tried corticosteroids, IVIG, what else? Monoclonal antibodies. Hmm. Uh, I just barely started with the IV vitamin C and the NAC. Hmm. Uh, hmm. We've tried the naughty horse paste. Um, hmm. You know, um, when you're that sick, you're willing to try whatever Anything. to get your life yeah. back. Yeah. I mean, you've already yeah. lost everything. so. Yeah. What else do you have to lose? Yeah. So yeah. we lost your voice. Uh, 
Bree. Am I there? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Oh. So Thanks. now we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. So we we lost you for a few seconds. So tell me this: when you were, so if I go point by point, corticosteroids helped temporarily, then not right. Bree, Bree, you there? So either my network is okay. Sorry, I so... just want to say I have never had this problem with an interview before. It may be on my end. <laughs> <laughs> it may be Streamyard, so not you. <laughs> so <laughs> you tried corticosteroids yes. that work temporarily, then go back to the same way. How about monoclonal antibodies? So I actually was one of the lucky ones to have a positive experience with, uh, with monoclonals. Um, it, it, and I even picked that data up on my walking heart rate data on my Apple Watch. It resolved my POTS. It didn't touch my neuropathy, but it was amazing to finally feel like I could be vertical and not feel like you know, there was a 10 pound weight on my head and my shoulders all the time. So, but right. it was temporary, you know, mm. and we've had a lot of people that went back and got monoclonals after the effects were off and the second run didn't have the same effect as the first. Got it. Um, how about NAC? The NAC, I'm still trying to figure that out because I had a weird reaction that I haven't had with anything else. My chest tightened up really tight. Uh, for about 30 minutes. And then it, after it went away, then I felt great. So I got to figure out what that initial reaction is, though, that's concerning for me. Got it. How about vitamin C? The vitamin C, I think, is going well. So I'm going to keep that one up. Got it. And you just had another IVIG. And how is IVIG working? The IVIG is, it stopped my neuropathy from progressing. My neuropathy was progressing up my arms and up my legs and the IVIG stopped it. And now it's starting to reverse. I did get COVID two, or I wanna say about a month and a half ago. And my symptoms came raging back. The internal vibrations came back. The tinnitus was really bad again. And the POTS was bad. My neuropathy was raging again. And so as soon as I came negative, I went back in for IVIG and it helped tamp all that down. So it feels like I kind of hit a reset button on my recovery. It set me back quite a few months from getting COVID. Um, so I'm hopeful I don't have to get COVID again. <laughs> but hopefully it does kind of, yeah, it does make me suspect that, you know, you know, the, um, the etiology that's going on, you know, uh, would I have had the same reaction from, you know, the wild spike as I did from, you know, the vaccine mm. spike? Maybe. Mm. Maybe. Yeah. Denise says, uh, what about IV NAD? I haven't tried that one yet. D3 or vitamin Ds? I did vitamin D and it, it actually, I didn't notice a big improvement with it. I still take a thousand vitamin D every day, but mm. I did do a high dose for quite a while. Low dose naltrexone I did do. Low dose naltrexone so, is something I do every day. Okay, so you are on the maintenance dose with this? I'm actually, um, just like very many other vaccine injured people, I have yeah. to take very small doses of medication. So I'm sitting yeah. at one. So oh, wow. one milligram <laughs> and it helps every, every yes. night. And so if I've, got, I've tried to go up to two and it just knocks me out. So I stick with one. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Jim says, does she know what her vitamin D3 levels are? My vitamin D3 levels are healthy and they're actually a little bit on the high range. I see. I'm just looking at the questions. Uh, Augie says, any other therapeutics that helped? Yes. Um, tamping down inflammation ha uh, 
gave me a significant uh, jump in my recovery. And so low histamine diet, very clean eating, which I was not that person before this. I ate whatever I wanted, but I've been very strict, no gluten, no dairy, um, fresh food, fresh meats, uh, no corn. Corn sets me off pretty bad. And that's one of the things that really helped you know, resolve my brain fog and my disassociation that I suffered with for six months straight. So once mm. I cleaned up my eating within a week and a half, my brain clicked back into place and mm. my personality came back. So that was a big one. Got it. Thank you very much for that. For that. Okay to let go says, does IV mean how the med is administered? Yes. So for example, in IV, IG, intravenous immunoglobulins. So yes. Um, Equin says, killing me with the abbreviations. Apologies. We'll, we'll try to expand on those. LDN is low dose naltrexone. IVIG is intravenous immunoglobulins. Um, vitamin C is vitamin C. D3 is D3. Vitamin D3. Um, NSC is N acetylcysteine. And uh, hopefully that clears up some of these. This is an interesting one. Jade says, have you tried intermittent fasting and or carnivore diet? I have heard good things about both. I'm currently underweight, so I'm a little nervous about the intermittent fasting. I'm going to have to be, you know, be under some really good supervision to, to try that one. Yeah. But I've heard good things about both of those. Got it. Um, so there's a question, is she doing the FLCC protocol for long COVID? There is actually a protocol coming out for vaccines. Have you tried anything? I mean, many of these LDN type things are from the long COVID. I'm just starting to implement the FLCCC protocol for their vaccines now to see how it goes. Um, I see. I'm encouraged by what I've seen so far. So we'll see how it goes. I am sure that it will be uh, better than the steroids only or IVIG. And there is a reason for that. Uh, even plasma phrases. So if uh, cool beans, uh, we are already about 40 minutes in. If you give me a few more minutes and uh, Brie, if you have some time as well, if I can explain why these things are only temporarily helping. I actually was doing this drawing with you before as well. So I'm going to try to use the same drawing again. So, so audience, cool beans, if you can give me your attention for a few minutes, imagine that this is a vaccine generated antigen. This may be spike protein or some other antigen, but here in our context, this is spike proteins piece. What we do is our B cells in response to the antigen, make antibodies, this red one, that can bind with this antigen. So let's say there is a binding site and then this is the binding site. So this binding part is called epitope. So first message that when we got the vaccine or any antigen, even if the virus arrived, our B cells will make antibodies that can bind with that antigen. So far so good. What will happen is if it is a vaccine, we have trained our B cells to make these antibodies so that when the actual virus arrives in our body, that virus is also going to have the same kind of antigen and that would allow these antibodies to quickly bind with the virus and kind of neutralize it and clear it out and wipe it out and so on. However, our body has a need to go back to normal state. We try to do that all the time with the temperature, with everything. We want to do homeostasis. Homeostasis is we want to go back to our normal state. So body wants to do two things now. It wants to get rid of these B cells and it wants to get rid of these antibodies. Because the, this is an abnormality in the system, if you will, because this is inflammation, this is more cells produce, more antibodies produce. We don't want to produce them forever. So for the homeostasis, there are many mechanisms. For example, there is a mechanism of T regulatory system, which will come 
and become active and start reducing the activity of these cells, there would be a message to these cells to kill themselves as well. So there are many mechanisms that would allow these cells to calm down or to go away, leaving some memory cells in the system and these antibodies to go away. Now, one of the system, one of the mechanism is called network hypothesis. And that is, uh, it was proposed by Neil Jen Jenkins, I believe, in 1960s. And recently, um, you have met Dr. Bill Murphy, Dr. William Murphy here on this channel, who then did a study on the SARS-CoV-2 patients and observed the, the activity of the network hypothesis. I'm going to explain that. And by the way, Dr. Bill Murphy will be with, with me on this Monday. So the network hypothesis says that for our body to bring us back to the normal state, what the body does is it activates another set of B cells that make another set of antibodies. These antibodies are against these antibodies. So now these two kind of clump up together and clear out each other. This is a way for body to reach homeostasis fast. But the problem in this one is that this new set of antibodies that is able to bind here with the older set of antibodies, these antibodies, this new set is called anti-idiotype antibodies. These antibodies have to look like the original antigen which made these antibodies happen so that these two guys can connect. So I hope you see the problem then that when we make these antibodies, these are going to be anti-ACE2 antibodies or other such antibodies that are going to attach to various ACE receptors that these antibodies are going to attach with these antibodies making the complexes. These antibodies can attach with other parts of our cells. And the end result is if this process is not successful and it does not ramp down, then we have a problem. We have these anti-idiotypical antibodies that are going to act like sort of spike proteins. And now they are behaving by, they are misbehaving by stimulating ACE2. This is where that, um, what was that German company, Cell Trends, and I have no relationship to them, no in, uh, financial or other Things attached. Cell Trends does some autoantibody panels where they can tell you if you have autoantibodies, let's say NTAs2 and so on. Now, the problem when we give IVIGs, the function of the IVIG, what is an IVIG? We take antibodies from 10,000 people in a community, we take their blood, from their blood, we take the antibodies, we put those antibodies in a vial, while we give it to the patient, for example, Brie here, and we are hoping that this vial of antibodies has some antibodies that are against this and against this and maybe against virus. And when these antibodies are administered, these would stay in the body for three to six weeks and they would mop up any other offending antibodies present in this patient's blood or plasma. If that happens, the patient would feel better for a few weeks. But these two guys, the B cells are not dead. IVIGs do not go and kill the B cells that are producing these antibodies. And I was, uh, my wife has uh, some vaccine symptoms as well. So this morning I was explaining it to her. I was saying, look, imagine we have, we have two cats and these cats go and use the litter and they they poop there. Imagine the cat's poop is the antibody and the cats are the B cells. So when we clean their litter, we are getting rid, rid of those that cat poop, those antibodies and we'll feel better and the area is clean and there is no smell and all that. But the cats are still there. They will still continue to make more poop. And as a result, these antibodies would start reappearing in the blood after a few weeks and the patient would start feeling the same way again. 
This is the same thing with plasma electrophoresis as well, that electrophoresis would take care of some of these antibodies, maybe even some of those B cells or T cells that are circulating in the blood, but mostly the antibodies, and then the plasma would start having these issues again. The solution is going to come from how do we take care of these cells? How do we quiet them? How do we stop them? For example, intermittent fasting would help to stop them. For example, when we give these uh, steroids, at least temporarily these are stopped. That is going to be the basic mission for all of us to figure out how do we get rid of these cells. My apologies, I took some time to explain this, but Bree, I hope uh, that explained a bit of the situation. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. So uh, with this, let's see if we have any questions, otherwise we'll break. So there is a question from Tina. Difference between sub-Q versus IV, IV. IV, IVIG, any studies as to which is better? So uh, it depends upon the patient. There are some patients who respond better to subcutaneous and some who respond better to the IV. Normally, if a patient does not respond better to IV, then they try to, and they still need it, then they try to do subcutaneous. Uh, Vinod says, could cardiac issues reported post-COVID vaccination be actually rooted in neurological damage rather than uh, myocardial damage? I think it is both. So here in this study that is coming out of NIH, uh, they are saying that there is a tachycardia and there is cardiovascular outcomes, and these are neurological. So neurological is possible, plus a direct attack on the heart or the inflammatory molecules going into the heart and causing inflammation, antibodies going to the heart and doing it, those complexes of antigen and antibody depositing on the blood vessels and heart. So there are many mechanisms that can involve heart. Skyfrog says, what was your reaction to previous standard vaccines? That's an interesting one. Did you have this kind of a re reaction to other vaccines? Nope. Lifetime vaccine taker. No problems. Hmm. Augie says, did you experience cycling symptoms? So do you yes. go in remissions and relapses? Yes, it ebbs and flows. So, you know, like I said before, my body feels like glass. So I have to pace. Hmm. If you look upon hmm. Dysautonomia International, they have a whole theory on spoon fear theory. Um, and it's, it's all about pacing. Make sure that you don't overdo it, that you're eating the right things. Um, mm -hmm. that you're giving your body the very best chance it can to, you know, repair itself. And uh, Augie, this Monday, this is the exact question I wanted to ask Dr. Bill Murphy. He's a PhD in immunology. He runs a BSL, he heads a BSL-3 lab where there is research going on on immune system plus on cancers. So he would be an excellent guest so the, there were two questions I requested him to discuss with us. Number one is your question, cyclical um, relapses and remissions. And number two, what is the way to take care of these B cells, these cats that are just sitting there now pooping or making antibodies? So these are the two questions we're going to ask on Monday. So some, some praise for me. <laughs> Bob Channel says, very good explanation. Thanks. You're very welcome. Um, John653 says, where can this wonderful lady go to share her experience? Scary to think that there are many people like her that we do not know about praying for you. So how have you, have you been vocal about what's happening and educating others and helping others? Sorry, it happened again. <laughs> okay. So uh, how about your activity around this? Have you been helping others? Yes. Yes. We've been, we've been trying to actively get the word out. Of course, you know, as well as I do, that in the political climate, the political climate that we're in, it's extremely challenging uh, to get these stories out. And it does make me wonder, had we actually taken an approach to this like we have for previous 
diseases because this is medical. This is not, this is not political. This is a disease. You know, it, had we addressed this appropriately with objective findings and evaluation, I really do suspect that we would be in a different situation this far into the vaccine rollout. So we launched react19.org. We have physicians networks that we're building, mental health uh, resources there, webinars that are not nearly as good as Dr. Bean's, but we're trying. And uh, we're also trying to increase awareness. We're trying to get the word out. Uh, we had an article in Science Magazine, a recent one in Newsweek. Um, so we're just going to keep, you know, plugging forward to see if we can make a difference in people's perception, people's understanding as to this new illness. Thank you very much for doing doing this. And I believe Sean is also part of React 19. He discusses that. Yes, he's that our too. research director. Yes. Awesome. Good to know. Uh, meanwhile, in America says, Bree, did you ever find out what dosage they gave you in the study? Was it the standard vaccine dose? Yes. So there was uh, a subset of people that got half of the dose. I got the full dose. Adam says, has Brie improved at all in general, or has she stayed at a certain level for a while? So before I got COVID, I was starting to slowly get back on my uh, spin bike. So I was, I was seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and then COVID set me back quite a bit. So we'll see if it takes as long for me to get there, because it was well over a year before I got to where I could you know, start using my body how I used to. So it's, it's going to be all about those cells that are persisting and to eliminate them. The faster we can eliminate. So what is happening is the time factor here is the factor where the cells would become eliminated by themselves and some of them would sit down as memory cells and they would live forever or for a longer time. So maybe there would be therapies that would help to accelerate the process of becoming quiet or or apoptosis or dying. Augie says, brain fog cleared completely via diet? Question mark. I would say at least 75%. I was in and, rough shape. Like I get up every day and I would say um, my brain is altered permanently. I thought I was, I thought I was altered. But for people that are in that state, I want you to know it can go away. You just need to hang on, clean up your diet. And if, if it's not the diet, it'll be something else. There's lots of things that you can try. It's really frustrating. Um, it's, it's horrible to have to endure that, but the key is to hang on and, and it will, it, that part will get better. It may take months, but it will get better. And so tell us once again, in the context, I know you talked about the diet a few minutes ago, but if you can add that back here as well for the completion of this question, what is clean diet at least for, for you? So I, I'm on the low inflammation diet and or low histamine diet. And if you look it up online, there's quite a few resources that are available. Uh, no dairy, no gluten, which I know hearing you can't eat that stuff sounds really sad. But if it means that you're going to get your life back, you know, it's worth it. And so I don't miss those foods because they make me feel really, really sick. So, you know, it's, it's, oh, no alcohol, no drinking, no coffee, um, very fresh vegetables, very fresh fruits. I still can eat beef. Some people can't eat beef. I eat fresh pork. So, and eggs, I can eat eggs. Most people can't, but it's fresh every day. I have to make sure that I cook it every day. Um, three meals a day, which that, that's a hassle, but yeah, yeah, well, at least it's helping. Um, mm -hmm. Kelly is saying, Has she met other vaccine injured people who have developed eosinophilic esophagitis? We've heard a little, a few people that have had that. Um, a lot of people. To be honest, we have a, a bigger group that it's just massive gut dysregulation. And so it's coming up into the esophagus. Um, and, you know, there's some theories, I'm sure that you've heard about that, that, you know, COVID itself will, is one of the very few viruses that can actually change the microbiome in your gut. 
And so it does make me suspect if this is, you know, rooted in some kind of issue with the spike protein, there is the potential that the vaccine could do the same. And so that is a big part of, of getting well is making sure that the gut's taken care of and, you know. Got it. So I, I'm aware of the time. Thank you very much for your generous time and discussing your uh, situation in the context of this study. I, I am disappointed at this study. A uh, couple of more questions. Jim says, have you tried heat shock treatments? I have not yet. And quick clarity that I'm, I'm disappointed at the study. I'm very, very happy that the study is done by NIH and NI neurodegenerative uh, neuro disorders, neurological disorders. The disappointment is that data does not look like correct. And it is too late. It is. It seems like not accurate data. The therapies don't seem like something that they should propagate to say these are good therapies. They should actually caveat them heavily. And um, it's just there are lots of uh, weaknesses in that study, which I would not have expected from a study coming out of NIH or NID. N-I-N-D. So that's what is my frustration. One more question. Um, John Miller says, what vitamin D scale is she using? Aim for 50 to 60 nanogram per milliliter or higher. Okay, I'll look into that. Okay. Um, so this is the, so <laughs> one more question. Skyfrog says probiotics. Have you Those been are using... important. Yes. And bifida, bifida has been big, and not just for me, but for others. It has to be a specific kind because it can set off a, a reaction that's similar to MCAS, but a lot of us aren't diagnosed with it, but those protocols still work. So it's got to be, you know, there's different probiotics out there that work and some that don't. So if you get a probiotic and it's setting your symptoms off, or if it's making them worse, try a different brand. Um, there's Dr. Hazen has recommended just using activity, Activia. Uh, I know Merrick recommends a different kind um, that's dairy free. So that's one of those things to experiment with to see which one you can tolerate. Got it. Uh, John says, thank you for continuing to advocate for the injured Brie. So, and thank you, yes, from all of us. Denise says, have you used HBOT? Hydro, uh, hyperbaric oxygen chamber. That's on my to-do list. It's uh, pricey. So hmm. you got to save up, you know, like a teenager, they save up for a car. That's what we're doing for HBOT right now. Got it. The, if they would have recognized these situations earlier, at least insurance systems would have been able to start covering them. But they just let the whole thing happen without recognizing them while they knew it. Apparently, it seems like they knew and they were actually talking with the patients and they were not making progress with the patients. And then they just dropped the studies. And now they're 17 months later, they're coming in and saying, hey, look, we did some studies too. Anyways, that, that makes me sound angry. But and it's, um, no, it's, so, it's, I totally get it. It's, it's a hard situation. And, and being in this, living this, you know, through the last 17 months waiting for the study to come out it's been it's been hard um because i because what i knew they were doing what i knew what they knew and what they could do by just talking about it how many lives they could save how many people they could prevent from getting ex you know worse from people you know what would have happened had america been afforded the potential for early intervention when these patients were landing in ERs for the first time during the acute phase. So. Absolutely. And yep. And I believe that these patients actually need quicker, immediate interventions. And the faster they are receiving therapies, the better outcomes. So trying to, um, at least this is my, uh, my feeling that they try to keep it hidden um, so that others don't become nervous and not refuse to have vaccines. I think that's, to me, that seems like the reasoning, but of course I'm trying to read tea leaves, maybe not. 
but if they were recognizing it before, many people's misery, even if we just know that this is something that is acknowledged, this is a side effect that is recognized, people will feel much better than just not even having a recognition and just figuring it out by themselves. So uh, with this, Bree, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for discussing. Thank, thank you for presenting your situation. Thank you for discussing all the therapies that you've tried. Uh, again, for the listeners, these are not medical advices. Please talk with your doctors, figure that out with them. Everybody is different. Every drug behaves differently with people. Then the interactions are different. Your foods are different. Your body habitus is different. So please, please, please do not uh, experiment on yourself. This is more of an informational video. Take it to your doctor. My request is, this is where I would request you, please like, subscribe, and share. Don't like and subscribe. That's just my habit of saying, share it with others. Let people hear this out. Because I know there's going to be a lot of excitement about the study that came out. But there is some important data that is missing. And there is some more color that needs to be happening. And I think that is what we have here. So with this, uh, audience, thank you very much for being here. Bree, thank you very much for being here. I'm hoping I can have you and more participants from this study with us over here and continue to have these discussions. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Bye-bye for now.